So welcome to Karuna Live, All Art Disguises. This is a, an opportunity to explore a teaching in Tibetan Buddhism called the realms, the six realms. It's a classic teaching that is um, a part of the Karuna training to your cohort. And also, yeah, many, many classic approaches, including Tibetan Book of the Dead, exploring what, what happens after we die and possibly before we are born. Um, depending on how your beliefs bend. So that's where these teachings come from originally. And they also, the many Tibetan teachers have been translated into our psychological states. So talking about them both as possibly realms or place, actual places that we go after death, and talking about them as more micro states that we go into and can get stuck in. And the stuckness is what makes it like a realm. Not just going there is not a realm, but getting stuck is the realm quality. So I want to give, really give credit to that and say that um, I've been learning a lot lately from someone who's basically goes by Doc Tenzin, who's a Tibetan uh, trans man who who teaches a lot on Instagram and also on his own website. And we'll send out a link to his work after this. He's done an incredible course. That reminds especially white practitioners of Tibetan Buddhism in North America <laughs> that there are at least a couple of things that need addressing and repaired. And one is to actually look at the origins of Tibetan Buddhism and look at while many people came as refugees to North America and brought the teachings with them, we also need to honor the country from which they came and cultivate our relationship with those lineages and people. And then also, of course, that Currently, I am on, in Madison, Wisconsin, which is actually Ho-Chunk land. The Ho-Chunk name for this place is Tejop, so four lakes. And um, to heal those relations, too, to work on both the indigenous people in the place where we are and also the indigenous people of the place from where our teachings came. So this is not, uh, talking about the realms of psychological states is not extractive. It's not meant to be a personality test or anything at that sort of surface level. But it is adaptive. It's been adapted. It wasn't really talked about that way in Tibet. It is talked about that way more by Tibetan teachers in North America and Europe. It's possible that for other folks watching the recording may not know as much about Kruna training. So Kruna training is a school of contemplative psychology based out of Colorado currently. And at this point, we are mainly doing online offerings. We do have one current cohort going through a third year of the program. We have postpone the beginning of a, a cohort, a two-year cohort, for May of next year. So if you'd be interested in the longer training, that's a great thing to keep an eye on. You can sign up for our newsletter. In the meantime, we'll have some online courses as well. We do these lives, we have podcasts, and um, there's an upcoming course, course I'm especially excited about with a, an instructor from Spain named Luchi Lopez, who is a Karuna training teacher. And she is working on embodying embodiment and ancestry. And I've studied with her before. She's done a shorter version of the course, and it is fantastic. So we'll send out links for that as well. And you can do a short version or a longer version up to nine months. There's also going to be a course on the Bardos with Melissa Moore, who's the director. And the Bardos actually are tied to this set of teachings, the realms. So they're mentioned in, in the Bardos. The Bardos is sort of our, again, our post-death, pre-birth experience, the liminal place. So if you, you know, after this, you get a taste and you want to know more about that, um, the Bardos course might be a great place to explore. And I'll be offering something in the spring. We'll probably be offering a couple of retreats and programs leading up to the new cohort. And I'll be offering something on creativity and the elements as well online. So. Just keep your eyes peeled for other offerings. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and take a moment to land ourselves, to take a moment to recognize the land that we are on, whether that's through a, maybe we know the indigenous people of the land where we are, and we can name them. If we don't know them, we know the land. We can feel that. So just feeling into the land that's supporting us right now. Feeling what you can with your skin. 
sense of pressure and weight. Taking in any sensory information with your eyes. Practice I learned from one of my teachers, Resma Menicum, is to orient in our space. Give your spine a gentle twist. Looking over your shoulder, moving slowly so that your nervous system can believe, begin to recognize that you are safe enough to practice for now. And maybe you don't feel settled. We're not trying to get to any particular state. You want to just recognize where we are. And a flavor of how we're feeling in this moment. Maybe we've been avoiding how we're feeling. There's so much going on in the world, no matter where you are. From genocide to climate chaos. Personal struggles. Taking a brief moment together to pierce the haze of that suffering and really feel into the present moment, even if it feels shaky. Take a moment to take a peek at your screen, <clears throat> seeing faces, if you can see them, or names. You can stay off camera. That's completely okay. Take a moment to orient to this temporary, tiny community. This is obviously just for the live folks, but seeing who's, who's here. So again, you're in a program called All Our Disguises. It's about the six realms. And I picked... October, because I knew in the faculty we pick kind of the months a year ahead of time that we'll be giving our live programs and podcasts. And I picked October because I knew I wanted to do something about haunting. Like haunting is something that comes up in many traditions at this time of year, whether Samhain or Dia de los Muertos or Halloween. So many different traditions talk about or explore a, a sense of the veils of this transition, again, between life and death, and possibly between death and life. And as I got closer to the date, I asked myself, what is one of the most haunting aspects of samsara for me? And samsara, for anybody who doesn't know that term, is the term that's used in Buddhism to describe the cycle, the wheel, the repetition of suffering. Many, many things drive our experience of suffering. It's like a water wheel that is perpetually being driven by our experience and our ideas. One of the pieces to me that drives suffering the most are the realms. And they are also, to me, one of the most invisible aspects of our suffering. And they're invisible because when we get into, when we feel some kind of way and we get into a state of mind, everything confirms that state of mind. So if we're really dealing, you know, whether this is a, a matter of um, clinical depression or a, a milder form of depression where we're still struggling with an overwhelm and sadness, everything reinforces that. When we're ecstatic and in love, everything reinforces that or seems to, right? The world seems to mirror back our experience. And we don't often question, is this actually what's happening? Could I be contributing to this experience? 
we just sort of say, well, this is what's happening and we, and we go with it. And sometimes it feels beyond our control. We're, we're outraged and overcome with anger and we're locked into it. And it seems like it's never going to end. And that feeling of this state will never end and I have zero control over it is a realm experience. So when we feel like we're in a, we're in a way, we're in some kind of way and we feel stuck and we feel like we can't get ourselves out and nothing else will get us out, that means we're in a realm. So the first, often the first way that we begin to notice is just through noticing that feeling of stuckness. Like, and, and as I'm saying this, hopefully you can think of some examples in your life at some time, maybe today. <laughs> I've got like two or three from this afternoon. I had a, I had a car appointment this morning that was supposed to, supposed to last an hour and it lasted three, right? And I just was like, will this ever end? And I was fully aware the whole time, like what a quote unquote first world problem, right? Like not a real issue. Didn't actually miss anything. Got a bunch of work done but it completely threw off what I was expecting to happen. And so I got stuck in this place and I just thought, this isn't going to end until they are done with my car. And I committed to that story. Like I'm, I'm stuck here until they get done with the car. And as I was leaving the mechanic, I realized they had seats outside. They had chairs outside. I could have left. I could have gone outside and sat in the sun the whole time, but I never looked outside of the mechanics. I just figured I'm stuck in this fluorescent lit space with bad coffee and um, weird popcorn, waiting, waiting, waiting for my car. And so it was like, it wasn't until it was done that I realized, oh, I was perpetuating this idea that I was stuck and I was blaming it on them. And I didn't realize how much I was reinforcing this story that I'm stuck. Now, this is a really mild version of this, but because it happened this morning, I wanted to give it, right? Very mild. It can be so much harder than that, right? Where we really are, sometimes we actually are stuck and unsafe. So I want to acknowledge it. That's not a realm experience. If we're in an unsafe situation and we're not in control of getting ourselves out, that's, that's an honest experience. <laughs> but if we are actually safe, and we continue to project unsafety into the situation, that's when we might be getting into realm territory. Sometimes you can't always tell which one it is. Most of us have, and we'll get to the realms in a moment, most of us have some realms that when we hear about them, we're like, yep, that's home. I know, I know that place. I spend a lot of time there. And we'll have some realms where we're like, I have no clue what it would be like to be in that place never once in my life spent any time there. And upon further reflection, we usually find that we spend at least a little bit of time in each of the realms and or we have intimate relationships with people who spend time there. But just to know this is not diagnostic. This is not, you're not going to leave tonight with some sense of like, well, I am always, I always go to the hungry ghost realm. That's, that's my thing. There's no always. We're ever changing interdependent beings. So it depends on the context we're in and the people that we're with. However, we probably have styles. We have habits. We have tendencies. And one of the reasons why I find the realm so helpful, besides the fact that even if it's not until afterwards, I can realize how much I was perpetuating my own suffering. Sometimes that getting aware of the stuck quality and helping me see what it is helps me get a little distance and a little compassion. And actually, it's more often the case that I notice someone else is stuck. So I can see them in it. But the, the idea is not to see that they're stuck so we can throw that back at them. Look at you. You're caught in the hell realm. You need to stop being so angry. Instead, it's a tool for compassion, right? It's clarity that helps us have some compassion. Oh, I see. This person is really stuck. And they could have been stuck there for an hour or for a year, right? P pretty much perpetually, even if they pop out in and again. So that can help us to, to understand a bit better. So there are six realms, and they're, they're always listed in this order that I'm going to give. And 
what I love about this order is that they seem to go from the best possible realm to the worst possible realm. But the fact is, all of them are stuck states. And so we'll talk about why even the best sounding realms are, are bad news if we get stuck in them. Another way I think of the realms is that they're kind of similar to our trauma responses, right? So we fight, flight, freeze, fawn. We get into these states and we, it's what generative semantics calls time traveling. It's like we time travel. Suddenly we're not here anymore. We're four years old and we're having this experience that adult us is having. That can also happen with realms, right? It's like we, something happens that triggers us and then we get caught in this realm and we tell ourselves this is what's happening. What's important to note is that nothing about that experience is wasted. It's all there's wisdom in those experiences. That's what Vajrayana Buddhism teaches us. And that's what we talk a lot about in Karuna training. There's a lot of wisdom, but when we get stuck, we lose access to the wisdom. So that's pretty much always the case. Stuck states cut off access to wisdom. So we have to get unstuck in order to access the wisdom that's always available. So in some ways, this is like, what's your style of getting stuck? Or what's your more elaborate form of trauma response? And I call this all our disguises because, again, it's like we are, we're dressed for that realm when we're in it. We, we can't recognize that we're in it, but other people can see it. Other people are like, Ooh, wow, okay, she's really stuck in survival mode, right? We may not recognize it ourselves, but it's like plastered on our faces and other people can see it. It's a little like um, emperor's new clothes, right? We think that we are wearing, we think we're just like looking normal and other people are actually recognizing that we're, we're off somewhere else. So I'll give the list first and then I'll, I'll break them down and talk about them a little and then we'll do a little reflection in between. I'm just taking a look at the, at the chat. Thank you for posting that. Um, is it okay if I read that out loud? I just won't use your name. Yes, thank you. So I found a lot of ecological grief and ecological anxiety due to the climate change crisis has increased my anxiety tremendously. I feel like locally and globally, it's a major downward trajectory. For example, the summers in Seattle have become really hot and it acts as a trigger for my fears. Thank you so much for naming that. And I think one of the aspects that's so important here is that um, what's... I. I would never want to use the realms to gaslight anyone. I would never want to use the realms to say what you're experiencing is not true, right? So climate anxiety is real. It's a real experience. I attended a, a workshop a few weeks ago with a, a colleague, um, and I'll, we'll make sure this link goes in with what's called the LOCA Institute here in Madison. Um, Tequila Chunglopa, and she talked about they have actually a course on how to work with eco-anxiety, how to have build resilience for eco-anxiety, that because we are interdependent beings, we do feel it. Like we are actually feeling what's happening. It's not just your anxiety, your grief. It's the land's anxiety and the land's grief. It's the beings around you that we are, in Corona training, we call it exchanging, exchanging with our environment. So again, often our response is actually really wise. It's really, really, really freaking tuned in, completely accurate. But where, where it starts to turn into suffering is when we get stuck and we can't, we can't move with it. We can't work our way through it. We can't let it go, right? And that's usually not our fault. It's just that we don't recognize that's what's happening or we don't have the tools to, to get ourselves moving. Not even out of it. We don't have to leave it, but just to be able to be more flexible with it. Does that make sense? Thank you so much for naming that. Letting go on a variety of levels is very difficult. Heck, yes. <laughs> this is why we practice, because we need a lot, of, a lot of help practicing. And I find the realms are one way to notice what's happening. And usually when I can notice what's happening and have some reference point, it helps me let go a little bit more. So hopefully this will be helpful for that. So keep, we'll keep holding that. I'm holding that with you. Thank you so much for naming it. So the six realms, the first realm is called the God realm. The second, it, the classic name is Asura, but it's also called the Demi-God realm. 
Third is the human realm. Fourth is hungry ghost realm. Fifth is animal realm. And sixth is hell realm. So you see what I mean by saying God realm sounds like a really good place to be. Like who would not want to be a God, right? Like that's that's the word we use, the word God, to kind of describe being all powerful, having having access to everything, being able to see the bigger picture. But the understanding behind the God realm is actually that there are beings who believe that they are all powerful, who believe that they can do anything, but they can't. And part of the price that they pay for that belief is that they're completely disconnected from reality. So I'm going to make no judgments about billionaires as a complete lateral. One of you might be a billionaire. I don't know that. I'm not saying that inherently being a billionaire is going to put you in the God realm, but it would be pretty hard, I think, to keep in touch with everyday life if you were managing that amount of money. So the act of, of hoarding a lot of money requires a lot of ignoring, ignoring interrelationship, ignoring cause and effects, refusing to see how, how ex, some, some of us having incredible excess amounts of money and property that is directly related to others not having that. Whole countries can be like this. The U.S. has a bit of a God realm complex, right? We sort of think we're the best, we're on the top. I'm not saying everyone believes this, but this is a bit kind of the ethos. And we got ourselves here. We pulled ourselves up by the bootstraps. And we get stuck in this story individually and, and collectively. Most of us would relate to this in a very short-term way like having escapist pleasurable experiences. So um, say I go to a spa, which I've been wanting to do lately, and I spend all day in the spa and I really enjoy it. But then I leave there feeling like I'm a special person somehow, like I'm above others or I'm elitist. So not enjoying the spa is fine, right? But if I start getting kind of errors about it, it's another experience. I had a friend in junior high school whose father worked for some massive corporation and made more money than I could fathom at the time. And what I was thinking about when I was thinking about the God realm is how their house, they had a mansion. It's the first time I had been in a mansion with one child and one dog and one goldfish and two parents. And that was it. 40 room house with those people in it. Their house was dead quiet. Their car was dead quiet. Everything was quiet and it was, it was dead. It felt dead. The relationships in the family felt dead. And when I thought about them, when I wondered, when I was practicing, why are they coming up now? I thought it was a very haunting experience actually to be in that family's presence. I'm not saying everybody who lives in a mansion is dead, but there was a feeling like they had given up some of their humanity in order to have all of this. There was a feeling of protection, right? They also were very protected. They had an alarm system. They had a chauffeur. They had all these things. But what cost are they actually paying for that? And it's good for us to notice what kind of projections we put onto others who are kind of caught in the God realm. So there are certain politicians. It's great. Someone's mentioning in the chat the God realm of denial for the USA in terms of make America great again. The past was terrible for many people when looking at history. Exactly. So there's a, a halcyon kind of history and present day. We can get into this perfect place, but it's perfect for only some, like 1% of the population, really. And the rest of us, it's not going to be perfect. And the, and the thing about this is it's not even perfect for the 1%. There's the illusion of perfection, but it's not actually true. And the, the God realm in the Buddhism seems not so great, especially when compared to heaven or paradise in a more Christian sense. Yeah, absolutely. And that's partially because the realm teachings say these are, these are actually samsara zones. They're states of deep, deep suffering. So they're not meant to be like the hell, there is a hell realm, but the hell realm isn't analogous actually to Christian hell. It just happens to use the same word. 
it's not a place of punishment per se, but it's just a place where we get stuck. You could say everybody in a realm is going through suffering of some kind. So I think one of the things that's important, a lot of folks feel like they can't relate to the God realm. Like I don't, I don't belong to a country club where I go and get served by people who I don't see as human beings. Like there's, there's a lot of folks who are like, I don't see myself in that. So I think one of the things that's a great practice to do is notice where we, where we turn folks who might be stuck in the God realm into a caricature. We stop seeing them as human beings. We dismiss their humanity because they seem to dismiss other people's humanity. And that's a really important thing to watch out for, because just because somebody is dismissing you know, all beings, basically, or some beings, especially other humans, doesn't mean that it's going to be useful for us to dismiss their humanity. So doing the best we can to see both and, to see how being stuck in the God realm can cause a lot of suffering for other beings, and also how they are suffering in their own way. They're not in reality. So let's take a moment to pause. Close your eyes if that helps you go inward. And notice what's coming up for you in the God realm. We're not going to have discussion just now. We'll have that at the end. But notice, does this feel familiar for you or certain people or beings you know. What's happening in your body? Are you getting tense? Is there any part of you that feels activated? Just being curious. There's no indictment. It's okay if you feel numb if you can't relate, if you're spacing out. That's all information. And coming back gently. The demigod realm is sometimes also called the jealous gods realm. And that's a great name for it because that's what it consists of, is those who are not quite at god status, but close enough to get a taste of it. They get a whiff of it. Mm, I'm almost there. They're sure that they're about to arrive. This is the state of folks being deeply jealous just about to be famous, just about to be promoted, but totally insecure and unsure. So the example I thought of in my life when I was contemplating this is a friend of mine who died quite young. He died at 42 of um, stomach cancer. And he was a musician. He was an incredibly talented musician in a very unique, specific way. And he spent the majority of his adult life, luckily not the last few months of his life when he was able to let go, but he spent the majority of his adult life feeling like he just missed the biggest opportunity that was going to break his career. So there was a moment when, when what he was doing was really famous and Bjork was looking for someone to collaborate with. And there was a chance that he could have met Bjork and possibly collaborated with her. And he, he missed it. He got sick and missed the event. And another person who did the kind of thing he did went to it and got a gig with Bjork and their career skyrocketed. He beat himself up about that for a long time afterward. I should have gone even though I was sick. I would have gotten it. This would have been my big break. This is jealous God realm. This is demi God realm. I'm almost there. I almost got it. And it's either my fault or it's someone else's. More, more often than not, someone else's fault. It's Jones. Jones got that account, and so I missed my promotion, right? It's corporate culture, academic culture, one-upmanship, politics. Never quite there. This is a big part of white supremacist capitalist culture. 
keeping all of us feeling like if we just bought this next thing, if we just got this next degree, we would win. We'd be at the top. Not quite there, but almost. Envy and jealousy, just feeling envious or jealous of someone is not being caught in the jealous God's realm. That's just an experience of like having envy and jealousy. There it is. You appreciate something someone else has, and I either want it myself or I want, I don't think they should have it. But those are very normal human experiences. But when we get stuck into a story that someone else has what I deserve to have, and they stay there. That's the realm experience. So someone mentioned make America great again. There's very much the, the quality, especially white supremacy tells a story of zero sum. So if, if black folks, for instance, are given all of the rights and access, and we have things like um, equal opportunity, then white folks will lose out in some major way, right? There's not enough for everybody. That's what perpetuates this feeling, except for that that's not true. All folks could have access. All folks could have their needs met. But that's not how we tell the story. And that's not how the system is perpetuated. So again, notice if this feels personal. If you're like, ooh, this is a, I spent some time in this realm. It's kind of a known place for me, or I used to, or my spouse does. Notice if the opposite is true. I never spent any time here, and I think people who are like this are horrible. Just notice any way that you're responding. Again, if it helps, you can close your eyes. Notice what's happening in your body. You might be feeling a little nauseated. Whatever you're feeling or not feeling is fine. Gently coming back. I found over time that the last four realms are the most familiar for most of us. The human realm is the next one. You could say, well, we all live in the human realm. We're all humans. And it is true that that's perhaps one of the reasons why it's often a familiar place for us. But humans can also experience all of these realms. So the human realm, the particular flavor of suffering, the story that we tell ourselves is that this person will complete me. It's about relationships and people. I had a lot of this. My spouse knows this, so I'm allowed to talk about it in public. <laughs> when I first got married, I was like, oh, great. I've met the love of my life. I'm good. And within a year, I was already feeling like, but oh, but there's another person over there. Maybe that person is, but maybe I should have married that person. And I'm joking about it now, but it was actually very painful. I would go on retreat. Retreat is an awful place to have crushes on people. So sitting there in silence, fantasizing about someone. And I would not just be interested in someone. I would tell a whole story in my head that if I left my brand new spouse and married that person who I'd never even talked to and didn't know their name, my life would be better. Still happens a little bit, but not to that same extent. Not because I'm happily married, but because I've worked a lot of it out. Like what, what is actually going on here when I think someone else is going to complete me? Codependency is a big one here. So if you struggle with like your happiness is to contingent on other people's happiness, when other people are struggling, you go down, you focus on other people's lives and not yours. So again, taking a moment to notice, does this feel familiar? 
And you're like, oof. First time I heard about this realm, I was like, oh, goddamn, I've spent a lot of time there. So maybe, maybe the bells are ringing. Maybe they're not at all. You're like, I, I can't relate to this one bit. This is not what motivates me. It's not how I get stuck. Or somewhere in between. And how do you know that? Are you feeling it in your body? Are memories coming? The next realm, I apologize, I'm going to continue moving because I realize time is passing, is called the hungry ghost realm. And this is a very classic Buddhist image, a hungry ghost. It shows up in many, many Buddhist traditions in many countries and cultures. Um, The realm is not always talked about this way, but the image of a hungry ghost is a being who um, has a tiny throat and a massive stomach. And what happens is that basically they can't get the nutrients that they need. They can't get what they need because they can't get it through their pin. It's like a pin-sized throat leading down to a huge stomach. So no matter how much they try, they can't satiate their need because they can't take it in. So hungry ghost also involves longing, but it's a different kind of longing and completion. It's more like through food or drugs or material goods. It can be a little similar to jealous gods, but jealous gods is about status. I've arrived, I've got my full professorship, I'm the president, you know, um, I got a promotion, and Hungry Ghost is more about if I get this car, I'll be completed. If I could just get high one more time, that would take care of all my troubles. I just need a glass of wine and I'll be okay. Five glasses of wine later, I just need another one. Uh huh. Mass consumerism conditions humanity to be hungry ghosts. Absolutely. Another way to say that would be we have a natural inclination toward it. It is one of our forms and it exploits that. So I know it's just slight variation on what you're saying, but this is a possibility for all of us and mass consumerism exploits it. Capitalism exploits it. And you'll be, you'll be completed by purchasing something or consuming something. If you don't relate to this state, but you have people in your life who struggle with it, it's important to notice that we also, again, might tend to pity folks or kind of distance ourselves like I can't relate to that at all we kind of make up we put a mask on them right it's like a disguise and we say this is this person is just only their addiction and nothing else and we stop seeing them as human so a lot of working with the realms is becoming more familiar with this person's in a stuck state that doesn't mean that they are that stuck state but they are in this stuck state And we know what it's like to get stuck. We all do. It's key to suffering. So even if we don't get stuck that way, even if that's not our disguise, we know what it's like to get stuck. You know, I I could easily say like, well, I'm not really swayed by cars. Cars don't matter to me. And people who are swayed by cars, this is not a true opinion, but people who are swayed by cars, they're just, you know, they're being exploited by capitalism. But then I'm over here acquiring um, music. You know, or I'm like going out and and trying to amass as many spiritual experiences as possible to complete me. Just noticing again, what's arising? Does this feel familiar? Does it feel foreign? Is there a place in your body that tells you, ugh, this is my suffering? or Hmm, I'm not so sure about this. Or, huh, I can't relate at all. It's 
second to last realm is the animal realm. Most animals, most all prey animals, and most animals can be prey, especially when it comes to humans, go into survival mode when they're under threat. Humans do this too. Our nervous system, you know, adjusts, decides that we have to do just the basic survival and shuts down everything else, right? So this is part of trauma response for us. And we go down into just basic operation. And what this could look like when someone's in the animal realm is their day-to-day -day life is like this. So you may have experienced this. You're numb or disconnected or um, depressed or even very anxious. And it's just the most basic things only. That's all you can do. I have definitely lived in this before. You go to work, you come home, you maybe eat something, just microwave something, maybe a popcorn for dinner, go to bed. Like just the basic nothing else, no socializing, no enrichment, nothing else is happening. We're just stuck in this, the image that's often used as blinders on a horse, right? Or like a mole underground, can't see, just keeps moving forward. <laughs> this is not to say that animals are, are dumb or that they all suffer. It's to say that when we are in this state, we're in pure survival mode. Most animals live in survival mode. There's increasing proof that there's some sense of play and sexuality and enjoyment in animals' lives. But a lot of them, especially prey animals, spend a lot of their life in survival. Survival mode is a thing that we need sometimes, really. We see a lot of that nowadays. But when we get stuck in it and it's not actually what's needed, that's when we're stuck in the animal realm. So we're not actually under physical threat. But we, but we feel completely shut down and we're only able to barely function, that's animal realm. And again, we can be in that state in part because we have something really happening. We're having a mental health challenge, for instance. We're really struggling with depression. Depression can put people here. Oppression can put people here. <laughs> Let's be very clear. Right. So a lot of people are operating in survival mode, which is speak for the United States, because they're really being deprived of their basic means for survival. I'm not saying that everyone who doesn't have basic means for survival is in the animal realm, because plenty of people actually thrive as well, regardless of circumstance. But if you're taken away, if a lot of opportunities are taken away from you, you might be stripped down to the basic function and the depression, the cause of kind of feeling the weight and unable to function and express means that you're in an animal realm experience. So again, just noticing, is this familiar? How do you know if it's familiar or unfamiliar? Do you have judgments about it? Rejections? And gently coming back. The last realm is called the hell realm, which, as I mentioned, is actually not, it's a translation, but it's not the same as Christian idea of hell. All of the realms feel punishing. All of the realms feel punishing in different ways. The main experience of this realm is aggression. I can't tell you because I've been teaching Buddhism and contemplative practices for almost 20 years, I can't tell you how many people come to me and confess that they have road rage. It's like a confession because we feel like we shouldn't have anger, especially if you're practicing Buddhism or mindfulness. And, you know, like, and I have that experience too. I'll be in my car and suddenly I just get obsessed that this driver is doing something that's very dangerous to other people, but I, I become obsessed, right? I'm totally fixated on them. 
somebody was actually describing recently that they got so obsessed with how someone was messing up and driving that they actually started to follow them. And then they sort of woke up. It's like they just snapped out of it. Like, what the hell am I doing? They were in a hell realm. They were caught in this, this obsession, this fixation on how the other person was wrong and they were right. And they needed to take care of it. We have already made reference to how this shows how it, how the current political situation, let's say in the United States, shows up in many of the realms. This is a place a lot of politicians live in. They thrive on being right, on putting others down, judging others, assessing them. And that transfers to a lot of us, right? So we have a lot of voters also have our own ideas about people who follow the other party and they are, they're, they're total whatever and we dismiss them, right? I'm right, I'm righteous. I have the right view, right? It doesn't, it's not just something that, that Trump does and Trump's followers, right? I've met plenty of people who are like, I'm gonna vote for Harris and anybody who doesn't is a blank, right? Interesting sounds really similar. That binary discourse is what gets us into the trouble getting stuck in that. In the chat, I think about Jesus Christ and Buddha both went through extremely negative spiritual psychological experiences in the forest as part of their spiritual psychological growth. What did they bring to their experience that helped them navigate through and get out the other side and be so wise and compassionate? That's such a great that's exactly right because so many of actually the things that especially in the case of the buddha they struggled with had to do with with actually states of mind struggle with states of mind that we that we take to be reality so again just pausing to notice and i'm on my name we're almost out of time and i'll end the recording of the talk in the descriptions, and then I'll stay on for a while afterwards if you're able to stay and we can have a chance to, to chat. If you're not, I'm so sorry that this ran longer than I expected. Take a moment just to notice the hell realm and especially notice if you're like, yeah, I know other people who spend time here, but I don't because that attitude is a hell realm attitude right there. I'm never like that. I'm above all that. And just be curious. Is this, a, is this a place you haunt? Even if only for five minutes in the car. There's nothing wrong with aggression. But like anything else, if we get stuck there, it's damaging to us and others. Just to wind down the description and the talk so that I can close out the recording, just to say to handle all of this with incredible gentleness, especially if you're new to the realms, you could feel like I have the answer for all of my suffering, I'm going to diagnose someone else. And to know that our experiences are not so separate, right? We, we can do something called realm cycling, where we kind of go through each of these realms bit by bit. We can get stuck in one place one day, another place another day. So really only use this as a tool for compassion. That's what karuna actually means is compassion, right? So using the realms as a tool for tuning in to understand better what your suffering and others' suffering is like so that we can remember our humanity and be kind with each other best we can. Or if someone's stuck and needs some tough love, Maybe that's the form of kindness and compassion that's needed. 
a reminder to keep an eye out for other Kernel Lives coming up, podcasts, of course, with Luchi Lopez on, on ancestors and embodiment, Bardo Coast coming. Yes, absolutely. Good to be with you too. Thank you for coming. Um, lots of good offerings coming up, but in particular, if you want to know more about the realms, the Bardo course will be a great place um, and, and in the cohorts. Thank you.